Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor presented by ProScan and today's vignette is one about the wrist. We'll specifically address tunnel syndromes, the carpal tunnel. Now I'm not here to I'm not here to sell you on MR as a test to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome, especially those of you primary care physicians that are out there listening. The diagnosis of carpal tunnel is a clinical one and is one that is also made with an EMG. On the other hand, there are certain unique situations where imaging is at the forefront of problem solving. And we'll discuss just a few of those. First, let's start out with the anatomy. The median nerve is found, as you might have guessed, in the carpal tunnel space. It has a few common variations. The uncommon variations we won't deal with today. But the common ones include the median nerve, instead of being positioned superficially in the tunnel, deep to the flexor retinaculum, and having a round or triangular appearance, it is located between the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor indicis tendons in what's known as the vertical median nerve. It has a more posterior to anterior orientation. Another variation that you may encounter is premature separation of the median nerve, either in the proximal carpal tunnel or before the nerve even reaches the tunnel. When this occurs, there is an increased incidence of a persistent dilated median artery. This is important because if there's a vessel traveling with this bifid median nerve, it can be accidentally cut and bleed excessively. Some of the other variations that are not shown include the anomalous lumbrical muscle, which may masquerade as a nerve itself due to its gray or intermediate signal intensity, and an anomalous flexor digitorum superficialis muscle, neither of which we'll address specifically today. Here are some cross-sectional water-weighted MRI images of the proximal tunnel at the level of the pisiform bone and the distal tunnel at the level of the hook of the hamate. Now, even though some texts describe that one of the MR signs of carpal tunnel syndrome is dilatation at the pisiform level and compression at the hamate level, we have found this to be highly unreliable since normally the nerve is a little more dilated at the pisiform level and a little more flat at the hamate level. And that's indeed the case. With high resolution, you can even see the fascicles of the nerve. The nerve, in this case, divided up into two bundles or fascicles separated by a thin membrane. Lying over top of it is a curvilinear arc-like or dark signal intensity, the flexor retinaculum, the superficial boundary of the carpal tunnel space, which is also highlighted with white arrows. Within this space lies the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus tendons, along with the flexor pollicis longus tendon. But outside the tunnel sits the flexor carpi radialis. There is also a deep transverse carpal ligament. Within the carpal tunnel, although not seen, is fat, better seen on the T1 weighted image. At the level of the hamate hook and the trapezium, the flexor retinaculum is a little bit thicker and a little flatter or a little tighter. Therefore, the median nerve is also itself a little flatter. You can see the median nerve dividing up now into two separate bundles just prior to its bifurcation. The flexor tendons are surrounded by thin, slightly hyperintense sheaths. These sheaths may thicken and become more hyperintense, and this is a reliable sign of clinical carpal tunnel syndrome. The amount of hyperintensity that one sees 
on these two examples is a demonstration of a normal sheath thickness. Here's what you might see in somebody with chronic carpal tunnel syndrome. Extreme thenar muscle atrophy with fatty replacement and or metamorphosis. This patient also demonstrates the phenomenon of the vertical median nerve. It is located between the flexor indices tendons and the flexor pollicis, the flexor carpi radialis sitting outside the tunnel. The nerve having a somewhat vertical orientation and on a T2 spin echo image, which is mildly water weighted, the nerve is of gray or intermediate signal intensity and this is normal. If we look at a patient with clinically symptomatic carpal tunnel syndrome, we may see bowing, bow stringing, or palmar displacement of the flexor retinaculum. The nerve may look a little larger. This particular nerve shows the individual nerve bundles within the sheath of the median nerve. Although the nerve is slightly swollen or increased in contour, it is very difficult to use the signal intensity of the nerve in the carpal tunnel space unless it's hyper intense on a typical T2 spin echo image. On proton density fat suppression images though, I tend not to use the nerve signal intensity for diagnosis. On this same image, we can see the sensory supply to the hand. Very basic as part of normal gross anatomy. The sensory supply to the outer two and a half fingers on the dorsum of the hand supplied by the ulnar nerve in red. The fingertips supplied by the median nerve on the back of the hand, although a little bit of the fourth fingertip is also supplied by the radial nerve. On the back of the hand, three and a half fingers, with the exception of the fingertips, is supplied by the radial nerve. On the palmar aspect of the hand, a little bit of the thenar eminence has its sensory supply by the radial nerve. The three and a half fingers on the radial side, all the way to the fingertips, supplied by the median nerve. And the sensory supply to the pinky and half of the fourth digit supplied on the palmar surface by the ulnar nerve. Now we said that MR is not the primary test for carpal tunnel syndrome, but it is an excellent problem solving tool in post-operative failed carpal tunnel disease or somebody who has a successful surgery and the symptoms become recrudescent. Here is a proton density spur and for those of you that are not imagers, this is a highly water-weighted, water-sensitive sequence. The median nerve is going to be somewhat hyper-intense, even in the normal state. So once again, we can't use the intensity of the nerve. We can use its shape, we can use swelling, and we can use one other very valuable sign to see why a person may have failed carpal tunnel surgery, and that is the space around the nerve. Normally around the nerve you should see a thin rim of fat just outside the dark nerve sheath. There's the nerve sheath. There are the individual bundles of the nerve inside the sheath. They're a little bit disorganized. They're not quite as well defined as in the last example that you saw. But most importantly on the fat weighted image where the flexor retinaculum has been released, where it demonstrates bow stringing and a B-shaped fibro fatty cleft. The nerve is now surrounded by gray intermediate inflammatory tissue effacing what should be normal hyperintense fat surrounding the nerve as a protective covering or pad. Furthermore, between the flexor tendons, the tissues no longer demonstrate any fat. The sheaths all merge together and even the fat in the deep carpal tunnel space is almost completely effaced. There's just a little bit of fat remaining for in the normal situation 
there should be a thin stripe of fat running all the way across. So this patient's failed carpal tunnel surgery is not for lack of trying by the surgeon where the release is complete and well performed. It is the inflammatory reaction that is surrounding the nerve and dissecting up into the rest of the carpal tunnel space. Now occasionally in carpal tunnel syndrome the symptoms are atypical. Perhaps the nerve symptoms are not in the typical three and a half digits or perhaps there is sensory involvement in the proximal aspect of the palm or there's a palpable mass, something that is atypical. In this short axis view, this patient who has a palpable lump in the distal carpal space demonstrates lobulated intermediate T1 and high signal intensity varices as the cause of their atypical carpal tunnel syndrome. This patient, a male with no specific risk factors for carpal tunnel syndrome, no occupational risk. The patient is not a jackhammer operator. The patient is not a typist, yet has severe carpal tunnel symptoms. We see a bifid median nerve and a thickened flexor retinaculum with a persistent group of median vessels traveling with the median nerve. So in this patient, it was an anomaly that led to the patient's symptoms, which were unusual for the fact that he was a man, he was a young man, and he had no known significant risk factors. Now this diagram demonstrates the median nerve branching into digital nerves, both proper digital nerves and common palmar digital nerves. But it's this nerve that I'm most interested in this adductor branch that lies along the course of the adductor pollicis. Sometimes that nerve can be compressed from simple fibrotendinous arch compression during the simple act of making a fist or bringing the thumb in. This patient had such symptoms of adduction induced neuropathy. But in this case it was not the fibrotendinous arch. It was a large, round, hyperintense mass seen in the short axis T2 weighted image and seen in the long axis water weighted proton density spur images that demonstrate a lobulated mass with a tail consistent with a ganglion pseudocyst. So in summary, MR is not the primary test for a simple case of carpal tunnel syndrome in a person in whom you'd expect it. Like a woman who's using a mouse or is typing or a jackhammer operator. But in somebody with a typical carpal tunnel syndrome or somebody with unusual demographics or a palpable mass or failed carpal tunnel surgery, this would be an appropriate use for MR. And the best signs to evaluate for carpal tunnel syndrome or a change in the contour or size of the nerve, signal around the nerve effacing the peritendinous fat, swelling of the flexor sheaths, but the signs of dilatation at the level of the pisiform and compression of the, at the hook of the hamate are of limited utility. Thanks and have a great day.